Hi, I'm Amy Goodman. Did you know you can get Democracy Now!'s headlines and stories delivered directly to your inbox every day? Just text Democracy Now!, one word, no space, text Democracy Now! to 66866 to subscribe to our Daily Digest, and you'll never miss a story. Once again, Democracy Now!, one word, to 66866. Thanks so much, and stay safe. From New York, this is Democracy Now! Government offices will be activated soon, and all employees, including women, will return to work and work in areas permitted by Sharia law. The Taliban holds its first news conference in Kabul since seizing control of Afghanistan. While the Taliban is vowing to form an inclusive government, thousands of Afghans and foreign nationals are desperately trying to flee the country. We'll go to Kabul for the latest and then speak to former Marine and State State Department official Matthew Ho. In 2009, he became the first U.S. official to publicly resign in protest over the Afghan war. Then we go to Texas. Uh, this is Governor Greg Abbott. As you may have heard by now, I have tested positive for COVID-19. I test myself every day, and today is the first day that I tested positive. Republican Texas Governor Greg Abbott tests positive as he bans vaccine and mask mandates in Texas and blames immigrants for the spread of COVID-19. The immigrant rights group Raices tweeted, Turns out it wasn't an immigrant or asylum seeker who was spreading COVID-19 all over Texas after all. We'll speak to Raices about also resettling Afghan refugees. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Taliban held its first news conference Tuesday, two days after it seized control of Afghanistan. A Taliban spokesperson said the group would respect women's rights and press freedom, but would not launch attacks on the U.S. and others from Afghan soil, and said it would grant amnesty to opposing forces. We forgive everyone because it is in the interest of peace and stability in Afghanistan. All the groups that were confronting us are all forgiven. The U.N. and others expressed doubt the Taliban would carry through on their statements, as images emerged showing wounded Afghans reportedly attacked by Taliban forces as they tried to make their way to the airport. There have also been reports of violence against anti-Taliban protests in Khost and Jalalabad, including deaths. An activist for girls' education, Pashtun Adorani, said the Taliban needs to take more concrete steps. The Taliban should uh, give a statement out that all these girls uh, should be going to all these public school, uh, uh, schools and no foot soldiers are allowed to harass them or target them or stop them. And then they should continue the way they are studying, right? If they're OK with all that, uh, we're good to go. Then I'm optimistic. But they have to walk the talk. Right now, they're not doing that. Top Taliban leader and co-founder Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar returned to Afghanistan for the first time since 2001 Tuesday. The Pentagon's investigating after human remains were found in the wheel of one of its military jets that left Kabul Monday amidst the chaos of the Taliban takeover. This comes as the U.S. and other countries continue evacuating their own citizens. The White House said Tuesday at least 11,000 Americans were awaiting evacuation. Calls are growing for the U.S. to accept more Afghan refugees. Meanwhile, The Washington Post is reporting the Biden administration's frozen billions of dollars in Afghan reserves held at U.S. banks to cut off the Taliban's cash flow. Several top Democrats have vowed to look into Biden's Afghanistan exit strategy, including Senator Bob Menendez, chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, who blasted the administration for misleading Congress on the Afghan army's readiness to fight the Taliban. Meanwhile, a report from the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction said the U.S., quote, struggled to develop and implement a coherent strategy over the last 20 years in Afghanistan. 
In Haiti, the death toll from Saturday's 7.2 magnitude earthquake has jumped to nearly 2,000, with nearly 10,000 injured and some 30,000 people left without a home. In Lake High, near the epicenter of the quake, displaced residents were forced to huddle under tarpaulins as Tropical Storm Grace unleashed torrential downpours, further complicating recovery efforts. I am sick. I fell down when the earthquake happened. I am in a lot of pain. We have been promised medicine. I went to look for it, and I was told to wait. Yesterday, they distributed aid, but I wasn't able to get anything. It rained a lot at night. We could not sleep. We have nothing to eat. We have nothing. Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott has tested positive for coronavirus. Abbott's office said he's been fully vaccinated and was not experiencing any symptoms. In fact, he's been vaccinated three times. He's being treated with Regeneron's monoclonal antibody treatment, which is given to people with a high likelihood of developing severe COVID, though it's unclear whether Abbott fits into that risk group. NBC News is also reporting he may have had a third booster dose of the vaccine. Abbott imposed a statewide ban on vaccine and mask mandates in July. Two school districts are challenging the ban in court. The day before his office announced his coronavirus diagnosis, Abbott attended a packed indoor Republican club fundraiser in Dallas, where he and most of the attendees were unmasked. There were hundreds. In other news from Texas, health officials have requested mortuary trailers from FEMA as the rising number of COVID deaths could surpass the state's capacity to hold the bodies. Alabama's run out of ICU beds amidst the surge in hospitalizations. In Louisiana, over 3,000 students and school staff have gone into quarantine in the New Orleans Public School District after a number of positive COVID cases. In other coronavirus news, the Transportation Security Administration is extending the federal mask mandate for airline, bus and trains into January 2022. This all comes as the United States topped 37 million cases just eight days after it passed 36 million infections. In international news, New Zealand's on a strict nationwide lockdown for at least three days after identifying one, that is, its first COVID-19 case in six months. This is Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Delta has been called a game changer, and it is. It means we need to again go hard and early to stop the spread. We have seen what can happen elsewhere if we fail to get on top of it. We only get one chance. Since the lockdown was ordered, at least nine new cases were confirmed in New Zealand. In Japan, authorities extended a state of emergency in Tokyo and other areas in an effort to contain the ongoing surge in infections. Meanwhile, protests continue in Thailand, calling for the prime minister to step down over the government's handling of the pandemic. We demand the Prime Minister's resignation, as over the past two years, the government has proved that they can't solve the COVID-19 situation. Police have deployed tear gas, rubber bullets and water cannons during recent demonstrations, which are building on the anti-government and anti-monarchy protests that ignited in 2020. India is banning a range of single-use plastics starting in July 2022. The ban will cover items including plastic bags, cutlery and cups. But environmental groups called out the new policy for leaving out several other common items, such as plastic water bottles and many types of packaging. India generates some 26,000 tons of plastic waste each day. Much of it ends up in landfills. In Northern California, thousands of people have been evacuated after a new blaze ignited over the weekend and quickly tripled in size. The Caldor Fire has burned over 30,000 acres and was 0 percent contained as of Tuesday night. Meanwhile, the nearby Dixie Fire is less than a third contained as strong winds hamper firefighters' efforts. In southern France, hundreds of firefighters continue to fight a massive wildfire in the region of Var. Some 6,000 people, including tourists, were evacuated. The blaze started Monday evening and burned some 12,000 acres of forest by Tuesday morning. 
Back in the United States, House Democrats Tuesday introduced legislation aimed at restoring the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was gutted by a 2013 Supreme Court ruling. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, like the more sweeping For the People Act, is nearly guaranteed to fail in Congress unless the Senate ends the filibuster. The new bill was announced by Democratic Alabama Congress member Terry Sewell while standing in front of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, where the late Congress member John Lewis and other civil rights icons marched for voting rights in 1965 and were brutalized by police. Reproductive rights advocates in Arizona and Montana have filed lawsuits seeking to block new laws banning abortions in the two states. One of the laws in Arizona makes it a felony for doctors to terminate pregnancies because of a fetal genetic defect, such as Down syndrome. The other would classify fetuses, embryos and fertilized eggs as people starting at the point of conception. Both go into effect in late September. Meanwhile, in Montana, four new laws are set to take place in October, including a ban on abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy and restrictions to access abortion pills. Workers at the Nabisco factory in Richmond, Virginia, have joined hundreds of other Nabisco workers in Oregon and Colorado in a strike effort demanding humane working hours, fair pay, and an end to the outsourcing of jobs to Mexico, where wages are considerably lower. No contracts, no snacks. No contracts, no snacks. No contracts, no snacks, they chanted on the picket line. Nabisco produces Oreos, Chips Ahoy, Ritz crackers, and other popular snacks. Nabisco workers say they've been forced to work 12 to 16 hour shifts during the pandemic, often including on weekends. Three former Philadelphia homicide detectives have been charged in the wrongful 1993 conviction of Anthony Wright, an African-American father who spent a quarter of a century in prison on rape and murder charges. The three former police officers are accused of making false statements in the case. Wright was exonerated by DNA evidence after a retrial in 2016. And the billionaire Sackler family, owners of OxyContin, maker Purdue Pharma, said it would abandon a pledge to pay a $4.5 billion settlement to help communities that have been devastated by the opioid epidemic unless they're granted immunity for all current and future lawsuits. David Sackler, a former Purdue board member and the grandson of one of the founders, made the remarks as he testified at a hearing in federal bankruptcy court Tuesday. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Several of the Taliban's top political leaders have returned to Afghanistan after years of living in exile. The Taliban co-founder, Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar, who is expected to become Afghanistan's next president, arrived in Kandahar today. Baradar was released from a Pakistani prison at the request of the Trump administration three years ago. He was deeply involved in the U.S.-Taliban talks in Doha. Meanwhile, former Afghan President Hamid Karzai held talks today with the head of the Haqqani Network, a powerful faction of the Taliban. This all comes as the Taliban moves to secure its control of Afghanistan. On Tuesday, the Taliban held a news conference where they promised amnesty for former government officials and pledged to eradicate opium production. The Taliban also made promises to protect some rights of journalists and women. Government offices will be activated soon, and all employees, including women, will return to work and work in areas permitted by Sharia law. We and you see that in the field of medicine, education, police, and other sectors of society. We need women because it is a necessity of society. Despite the Taliban's pledges, many women across Afghanistan have not left their homes since the Taliban seized control. Earlier today, the Taliban opened fire on hundreds of protesters in the northeastern Jalalabad who marched through the streets holding the black, red and green Afghan flag. Al Jazeera reports two protesters were shot dead and 12 were wounded. The Taliban also reportedly beat journalists covering the protest. 
in Kabul, the capital, the Taliban has used live ammunition at checkpoints outside the international airport, where the U.S. and other foreign governments are evacuating its citizens and allies. The U.S. has also used live ammunition at the airport, killing two. The U.S. has so far evacuated 1,100 people, but as many as 15,000 U.S. citizens remain in Afghanistan. On Tuesday, the U.S. Air Force revealed it had found human remains inside the wheel of one of its C-17 planes that flew out of Kabul on Monday. At least two people died Monday after falling to their death after trying to cling on to a departing U.S. plane. Meanwhile, the Biden administration announced that it would freeze nearly $9.5 billion held by the Afghan government in U.S. banks, blocking the Taliban from accessing the money. We begin today's show in Kabul, where we're joined by Bilal Sarwawi. He is an Afghan journalist based in Kabul who's been reporting on Afghanistan for 20 years. Bilal, since we're first speaking to you since the Taliban seized control of Afghanistan, your response, were you surprised, the significance of the president, uh, Ashraf Ghani, fleeing the country, and what's happening now in the streets around you? Actually, I was uh, trying to get a marriage certificate uh, for me and my wife, and we were trying to get a passport for a newly born daughter. So I had spoken to government officials the day before. Some of them were my friends. The next morning, I was heading towards uh, those offices when I heard that the presidential palace employees were told to leave, uh, and uh, the presidential protection service, which is Afghanistan's equivalent of secret service at the time, were taking up positions. So there was a lot of confusion. And then in a matter of uh, basically 30 minutes or so, we found out uh, that the then-president Ashrafani was supposed to go to the Ministry of Defense to have a meeting at the National Command Center, which is a walking distance or a short drive. But instead, uh, Mr. Ghani had told his Secret Service detail that he would want to fly there. So the Minister of Defense was waiting. The Army Chief of Staff was waiting. The helicopters uh, changed uh, directions, and they were heading towards the Hamid Karzai International Airport. I think once that fact was revealed, uh, the entire government in Kabul crumbled in no time, just like it had crumbled across uh, many of Afghanistan's provinces where mass surrenders were negotiated between important provincial uh, you know, officials and the Taliban. I think it's a Taliban uh, strategy, as well as fighting on the battlefield over the last many months, at least, that they offered this insurance, that they offered this surrender deal. And I think this was the work of months, if not years, so it was surreal in many ways, because I had started my career in 2001 when the Americans were bombing the Taliban. I was a fixer translator across from the Pakistani city of Peshawar, and then I saw the fall of Taliban. And it was unbelievable to see how the tables turned, how there was panic and fear. My family this time was here. This time I was—I uh, am a father to a new uh, baby girl. Uh, and I was not exempted from the panic and fear, will there be fighting, will there be bloodshed, what will the Taliban do? But thanks God, Kabul fell to the Taliban without bloodshed, without fighting, although the vacuum created did uh, result in some looting and some uh, harassment and irregularities of uh, the citizens of Afghanistan. So I would say, for me, it was almost like, uh, you know, uh, in no time this happened. I, I, I just couldn't believe it, like many other Afghans. I want to go back to that Taliban news conference in Kabul, had all the trappings of, you know, a pre of a um, government uh, press conference. This is Taliban spokesperson uh, Zabihullah Mujahid. The enmity with parties to the conflict are over, and we do not want to live in enmity. No nation wants to face off internal and external enemies. Without a doubt, we are at a historical juncture where the political system fits in and we want. Let's form an inclusive government. At the moment, there are discussions that an inclusive government should be formed, and all parties and Afghans should participate in it. 
So, Bilal, if you could respond to what the Taliban said yesterday, I mean, clearly there is enormous international pressure, but the U.S. has been negotiating with the Taliban for months, excluding the Afghan government um, in Doha, uh, talking about uh, women's rights, uh, talking about protecting journalists, that's people like you, I presume, uh, talking about respecting the opposition and granting immunity. Well, it was interesting to see this elusive spokesperson. Uh, perhaps it was just a name, and there were many people operating under the name of Zabiullah Mujahid over the last 20 years, uh, face Afghanistan's vibrant media, that is, the gains of the last 20 years. So there were some really difficult questions. For example, a reporter asked uh, Mr. Zabiullah Mujahid why he had claimed, uh, you know, responsibility for the assassination of Minapal, who was sitting in the same chair less than 10 days ago, you know, for which Mr. Mujahid claimed responsibility. And then there was the question of what happens to the victims of uh, truck bombs and suicide attacks and roadside bombs caused by the Taliban, you know. So there were some uh, questions to which the spokesperson did respond. But what was very interesting that he insisted very publicly on the idea of the amnesty offered to everyone, that people do not have to fear the Taliban, that they will honor that. But there was, uh, you know, also revelations that the future government would be Islamic, although we were not told what that could mean, because Afghanistan already has an Islamic system. There was talk of media freedoms, and the spokesperson said that, yes, we would like criticism from the media so that we can do better. But the, uh, you know, media uh, should operate in, in a sense where it's in accordance with the Afghan culture and with the Islamic values. See, we will have to see what that exactly means. The, these uh, statements are open to many interpretations, and the Afghan people would like to know, you know, where this road now leads, because people are thirsty for a, a, a political settlement, people are thirsty for peace. And since the Taliban have taken over, uh, you know, at least here in Kabul, where we are, we are beginning to see that life is picking up. Slowly and surely, people are coming out, including some women. But it's not the same city, you know, that it used to be. The hustle and bustle, the traffic jams, you know, the business, the shops. Uh, for example, this morning, I went to uh, withdraw some cash. The ATM machines have been, you know, empty. So this is not the same Kabul that the Taliban left, for example, 20 years ago. This is the Kabul where there are shopping malls, there are ATM machines, there's an entire generation of citizen journalism, people have access to Facebook, to Twitter. And I think the Taliban political leadership knows that reality. And they are also wondering how that transition from fighting into governance uh, might take a place. We also know that in places like Doha, the Taliban political leadership got exposed to the highest echelons of you know, in other governments, including the U.S. government. So they understand how, for example, legitimacy works on the international stage and how they will need funding now that the Afghan National Security Forces, you know, are, are dismantled. That was like almost uh, hundreds and thousands of people, perhaps, you know, if you count their families. So they would know that if international funding does not come soon, if they don't have the legitimacy, how will they run the country? How will they keep Afghanistan functional? We have to really remember the Taliban are not the shadow government anymore. They have the total control of, uh, you know, the country. They are in control of ports, border crossings, airports, military helicopters, hardware. Uh, this, is, this is something that the Taliban would have not believed when I covered their fall, when they had some anti-aircraft weapons, when they had rocket propelled grenades on the back of a pickup truck. Today, they have night vision goggles, they have thermal, they have sophisticated, uh, you know, listening devices, for example, and many other, uh, you know, equipments that any government in this, in this part of the world might have. Well, I mean, they have millions and millions, uh, billions of dollars worth of equipment from the United States now, right, that gave it to the Afghan government, and they are now the Afghan government. Yes, uh, you know, especially when you talk about Black Hawk helicopters, especially when you talk about Omar Humvees and MRAPs, and when you talk about, you know, American rifles like M4, uh, the 
Taliban managed to break the backbone of the Afghan National Security Forces with the help of M-16, they would basically uh, place, you know, these night vision goggles on the top of it, or, or thermals, and in the dark of the night, they just literally, you know, murdered Afghan soldiers as they moved their heads out of their, uh, you know, checkpoints, or they came out to get water, or they were using, for example, bathroom. So we know that. We also know that uh, the red units of the Taliban, their version of the special forces, which was the single lethal force that they had that started to break, you know, the, the strength of the Afghan National Security Forces now deployed inside the city of Kabul. So this is, uh, you know, this is the Taliban bringing the cream of their crop before their senior leaders uh, might be coming slowly and surely into uh, this city. And we have to really remember, like the rest of the world, the Afghan people uh, have not seen or heard from these elusive figures. They've only heard their names. So it'll be interesting to see how they appear in public, you know, how their personalities are, what is their vision, because so far uh, the Taliban were not discussing such things. This was all about fighting. Now the time for talking, now the time for governance uh, starts. And as we see, like today, uh, they have been clashing with residents who are not protesting. They simply brought back the national flag that it was until last week and said, this is the flag. We have an emotional attachment to this. And they brought down the Taliban white flag. So there are issues that they would have not been dealing with. People would have not been able to protest when they were in power. And that really is, reality has changed today. Bilal Sarwawi, how do you compare um, what the Taliban said at their news conference yesterday with what's happening, for example, in Jalalabad? It is, I think, a surprise. This is the first uh, demonstration uh, of a type taking place under the Taliban uh, government. Uh, so they probably are surprised by this, uh, but there's some thoughts within some members of the Taliban that actually, you know, everyone is attached to their own flag. We should let those issues set aside for now. I saw, uh, you know, Mr. Mutmain, who is a member of the Taliban, he's very influential, writing on his Twitter page, a post in Pashto saying that this is not the time to, you know, discuss these things. Let's discuss these later on. Let's not create more headaches for Afghanistan. But I also know that some women yesterday, for example, came out and said, well, actually, you know, we want our own rights that Islam has given to us. And these women were literally confronting Taliban fighters on the streets. So you have, you know, smartphones, you have internet, you have social media things that they were not there 20 years ago. And, and again, it will be very interesting to see how the Taliban make the transition. I always tell people, let's see. I think that let's see category in Afghanistan these days is a must because every other hour, every other evening, every other morning, things change at such a rapid pace that it, it just leaves you even more confused and lost. For the first time since the Taliban takeover, one of Afghanistan's major media outlets, Tolo News, who we've turned to a number of times, uh, featured female anchors on screen Tuesday. One of its anchors, uh, Beheshta Agand, interviewed a spokesman of the Taliban. Meanwhile, CNN reporter Calissa Ward spoke to Taliban fighters in Kabul Monday and asked them about Afghan women's rights. This is what they said. How will you protect women? Because many women are afraid they will not be allowed to go to school, they will not be allowed to work. Uh, the, the female, the woman, uh, can uh, continue their lives, uh, and we will not say anything for them. They can go to the school, they can continue their education uh, but with, with Islamic hijab. It's so like I'm wearing. Uh, not like you, but uh, covering their faces as well. Cover the face? Off. Yeah. So you mean niqab? Yeah. Niqab. Why do they have to cover their face? Because that is in our Islam. Is it in Islam, though, that you of have to course, wear niqab? Course. So that's Clarissa Ward of CNN interviewing one of the Taliban in the street. Bilal Sarwawi, your response and also the significance of the female anchor. Um, her face also was not covered. Her hair was when she was talking to the Taliban leader. Well, it is extraordinary to see that Afghanistan's biggest uh, TV station, Tolo News, has a female presenter interviewing a senior member of the Taliban. 
uh, you know, publicly asking questions. This would have not been possible during the Taliban because, A, the Taliban did not allow uh, the women uh, to operate, be it in the media or public life or uh, civil service and other stuff. But Afghanistan also back then did not have this vibrant media. Afghanistan did not have uh, Tolo TV, which is, you know, a, a matter of national pride for Afghans. It has done so much for the country. It has trained a generations of younger Afghans. But this is also the same television station that was targeted in a suicide attack by the Taliban. Uh, a van transporting their employees was hit. So I say, you know, it must have been an emotional in a moment for the anchor, for the presenter, and for the editorial team, because these emotions are very raw. The heartbreaks are there. The pains inflicted on Afghans on all sides. And let's also, uh, you know, look into the Afghan culture. These things are never processed. People don't talk about it. So as an Afghan, I look at it in that context. But yes, will we have such freedoms in the months and years ahead? I don't know. Will the Taliban uh, recognize that this is a changed Afghanistan in the long run? I don't know. But it will depend how they want to conduct themselves with the Afghan people, with the neighborhood, and with the world. Because the Taliban would know that in 2021, Afghanistan is connected to the rest of the world and region. They cannot just operate on their own. And now they are basically the government. So there's the issues of trade, uh, there's the issues of uh, human rights. Education, for example, for girls is something that, uh, you know, a lot of European countries, including the United States, will be thinking very hard if the Taliban tomorrow says, OK, girls cannot like study, uh, you know, female education is banned. Where will that leave them in terms of funding? So we will have to see and we will have to also see how they deal with their thousands of fighters, foot level soldiers who have been fighting in the mountains and rural areas, and a lot of them have lost their family members. How can they, like, you know, bring them under control into this new chapter now that the fighting, at least for now, is over? Bilal, as we begin to wrap up, you wrote a piece for The Telegraph. You said, it's broken me from within. Uh, Afghan journalist reveals heavy toll of covering his country's collapse. That was the header. You write, I became a father recently because my own family and relatives saw so much heartbreak these past few years. I prayed that if God gave me a baby girl, I would name her Sola, which means peace. I did that thinking that at least my daughter might grow up in a normal country. So you are trying to leave right now. Um, how do you go about that? Have you thought about staying? Do you think you could possibly be safe in Kabul, in Afghanistan? Well, my, you know, like honest opinion here is that I would love to tell the story of the people of Afghanistan. I think everything that has happened, including, including the loss of friends, both within the government, outside of the government. And, you know, I have friendships within the Taliban. I have a classmate uh, from my days in Peshawar as a refugee, and we went different ways, has left me thinking, what is it that I can do that will comfort me, you know, that would make me think that I'm doing something better? And over the years, I've been having this conversation with myself, and then I committed myself to telling the story of this country to the world, not only the news side of it, I created a hashtag Afghanistan University many years ago, and where I basically showed the world the other side, the beautiful valleys, you know, the, the natural beauty, the lakes, uh, you know, what Afghanistan could potentially offer in the future if tourism was to come back here. And to be honest with you, I would love to be here like the rest of my colleagues and be able to tell the world our stories. Because 20 years ago, this country did not have this generation of reporters. And we owe this in large parts to our international colleagues where we started working as fixers and translators 20 years ago. And they helped us get where we are. So I think it's very important for the world as well to have a credible and vibrant Afghan media where different voices can be heard. Because we live in a world where we are interconnected. You know, there's no more any country in the rest of the world that will not matter for anyone else. You know, humanity is something that gives me hope. You know, people care these days about any country and anyone. 
especially like when you look at the activists on social media and such platforms. So I hope that I'm able, you know, and I hope that my daughter is able to basically one day go to school here. But there are things that are beyond my control. There are things that, you know, people like myself and my colleagues and other Afghans simply are powerless. We can't do that. I hope that this generation of leaders, both the Taliban and the former officials and politicians, can leave a legacy where we walk away from our painful historical political past, where governments came with coups and tanks and with bullets. And for this, I think the people of Afghanistan over the last 20 years have, pay, uh, have paid like a massive price, you know, a lot of sacrifices. I will not go into the mistakes, into the failures, into the issue of corruption. I think I would let history judge that. But the people in this country, you know, the lives when I look back, you know, there was a river of blood, like literally flowing. People gave their lives in districts for education, for health, you know, ordinary people. A tribal elder in Paktika, like, dedicated his own land, making sure that his daughter could go to school, like the rest of his district, you know. I think those are the type of things that I hope one day will give us uh, peace, you know, that has remained extremely elusive in our lives and the lives of uh, generations in this country. Bilal Sarwawi, I want to thank you so much for being with us, Afghan journalist based in Kabul, who's reported on Afghanistan for 20 years. All the best to you. Next up, we'll speak to the former Marine and State Department official Matthew Ho, who became the first U.S. official to publicly resign in protest over the Afghan war. That was 2009. Stay with us. Sing Like a Nightingale by Voices of Afghanistan. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue to look at Afghanistan, we're joined by Matthew Ho, a former Marine and State Department official. In 2009, he became the first U.S. official known to resign in protest over the Afghan war. At the time of his resignation, he was serving as the senior U.S. civilian in Zabul province on the Pakistani border. In his resignation letter, Matthew Ho wrote, I have lost understanding of and confidence in the strategic purposes of the United States presence in Afghanistan. I have doubts and reservations about our current strategy and planned future strategy, but my resignation is based not upon how we're pursuing this war, but why and to what end. Matthew Ho is now a fellow at the Center for International Policy. Matthew, welcome back to Democracy Now! Um, can you just respond to not only what has happened in Afghanistan, but the U.S. media coverage of this and who is framing the narrative? Well, thank you for having me back on, Amy. Um, I mean, it is, um, I think the only thing more tragic uh, than what's happened to the Afghan people is that in a few days, America will have forgotten Afghanistan again. So right now we're seeing a tremendous amount of coverage. A coverage. A lot of it is is really um, poor coverage, very simplistic, sticking with the narratives of the war, failing to look at the evidence. I mean, right now the prevailing narrative is that uh, Afghanistan collapsed because Joe Biden pulled 2,500 troops from a country the size of Texas. Uh, that's the that is like the depth. And, uh, uh, you know, thought that is going into this conversation in most major American media, um, this war uh, or this ending. Um, and I shouldn't say ending because Afghanistan is at a very precarious point right now. This could be the beginning of, you know, will be a cruel peace, an unjust peace. But 
perhaps an opportunity for Afghans to rebuild and reconcile if the violence is kept uh, to a minimum. Or it could be the next, the, the, just the next phase in this civil war that goes back to the 1970s, because what you have, you have warlords um, who many of the warlords sided with the Taliban over the last few weeks or months. However, there are many warlords who did not, um, as well as uh, uh, men in the government, like Amir al-Sala, who was Ashraf, Ashraf Ghani's vice president, who is now declaring himself the legitimate president of Afghanistan, along like with warlords like Muhammad Adenor, uh, Abdul Rashid Dostum, who have fled the country. These are men who do not give up easily. These are men who want uh, back what they believe is theirs. Um, and these are men who have long histories with the American CIA. Um, and that's where the CIA's allegiance may lie. So there is a bit, we are at a path here where uh, there may be a path uh, because of this cruel and unjust peace towards rebuilding and reconciliation, or this may just be the first phase in uh, the, the new uh, part of this ongoing civil war, because the Americans can look at this and say, look, this is exactly how Afghanistan looked on September 10th, 2001. There are some warlords hold up in some provinces. The Taliban control most of the country. And I can guarantee you there are people in Washington, D.C. right now who are saying, we did it in 2001, we could do it again, and this time we'll do it better. Um, and so it's a very scary position to be in, I think, right now for the Afghans for a number of reasons. Uh, however, with regard to the media coverage, uh, you see, uh, you know, to, to, to put it simply, you see the same people who've been wrong about this war trotted out over and over again. Um, the, the commentary is, is simplistic. It relies on the narratives. You have uh, uh, commentators who uh, say things about the war, about how Afghanistan, prior to Joe Biden's withdrawal, was in a period of relative stability, how there had been progress. Uh, you know, just complete lies and fabrications that are very easy to fact check, but that don't. And I think this is why Joe Biden uh, could go uh, and speak to the American public on Monday about a war that has devastated millions of lives, so much suffering. And Joe Biden can open that, that his remarks by lying about his opposition to the surge in 2009, which he did not oppose. Uh, you know, basically, he just wanted to send less troops than President Obama did, 10,000 less out of 100,000. That was Joe Biden's opposition to the war in 2009, send 90,000 rather than 100,000. Um, as well as, too, his, his lie about how the United States was not doing nation building. Um, there's an immediate environment here where Joe Biden and his people knew he could just open up those remarks with those lies and it would just be accepted. Let's go. Let's go back to President Biden's address on Monday when he came in from Camp David um, as he was being fiercely criticized for the chaos in uh, in Kabul and what's happened in Afghanistan. This is his address about the U.S. mission in Afghanistan. I've argued for many years that our missions should be narrowly focused on counterterrorism, not counterinsurgency or nation building. That's why I opposed the surge when it was proposed in 2009 when I was vice president. Matthew Ho. Well, I, I think there's so many things to unpack here. Getting back to the media, the, the, there is a narrative that the U.S. just didn't try hard enough. The outcome. So when Barack Obama comes into office in 2009, there are 30,000 uh, U.S. troops in Afghanistan and an equivalent number of NATO troops and contractors. Within a year and a half, there are 100,000 American troops, 40,000 NATO troops and over 100,000 contractors. So the United States had a quarter million man army in Afghanistan. And again, Joe Biden's opposition to that was to send 10,000 less troops. So Joe Biden's opposition would have looked like 240,000 troops and contractors in Afghanistan as opposed to 250,000. His the, the statements about not being a nation building effort. Uh, I was on a unit that was called a provincial reconstruction team. I mean, the lie that saying that to millions of, of men and women who served in Afghanistan, who went over there, took part in this nation building effort, and they knew they took part in nation building effort, and then have the president of the United States to so easily lie about how it wasn't about nation building. I think that is one of the best explanations for this war, for all these wars in the Muslim world, is this just the ease of lying uh, that occurs. And, and 
the United States, for the third point about this, the United States did try counterterrorism. The counterterrorism strategy that Joe Biden is speaking of is a strategy that General Petraeus utilized after General McChrystal left them, when we, the United States switched from counterinsurgency to counterterrorism. And what did that mean? That mean bombing villages and doing night raids, uh, and sending commandos 20 times a night into Afghan villages uh, to kick in doors and kill people. And you saw the results of that. The results of that was every year the Taliban got stronger. Every year the Taliban gained more support. Uh, this comes to the whole folly of what the United States did there. For decades, the United States gave the Afghan people two choices. You can either support the Taliban or you can support this uh, government composed of warlords and drug lords that is uh, corrupt, uh, non undemocratic, because all the elections have been incredibly in illegitimate and fraudulent um, and predatory. And the United States used a divide and conquer strategy. Uh, to try and uh, achieve its objectives in Afghanistan, just as it did in Iraq with the, uh, pitting the Shias versus the Sunnis. Um, and so what you have is you had an, in you know, what you have is, is, again, this choice, pick the Taliban or this government. And what has, been, has occurred in this last year is that Afghans, including non-Pashtuns, Pashtuns being a plurality of the country of Afghanistan, they are the ones who primarily made up the Taliban, who made up Taliban leadership, et cetera, who have been on the wrong side of the American divide and conquer strategy. But not only Taliban supported, uh, sorry, not only Pashtuns supported the Taliban, but Afghans from all parts of the country, all ethnicities have supported the Taliban because that's how bad of an option the Afghan government has been uh, to the Afghan people for these last two decades. So another aspect of the media coverage is just the uh, uh, inability or, or, or the unwillingness of the American media to speak about what the Afghan government was truly like. We hear a lot about women's rights right now, and we should. It's very important. It, 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 it's incredibly important. But how many Americans know that under the Afghan government, four out of five, as many as four out of five Afghan women were forcibly married, many of them child brides? How many Americans know that in Afghanistan, under the Afghan law, it's legal for a man to rape his wife? Or that in Afghan government prisons, the majority of women who are in Afghan prisons are not there because they are supporting the Taliban, but because of moral crimes. So, yes, maybe this Afghan government, this warlord government was not as theatrical in its misogyny as the Taliban was in terms of executing and stoning women in stadiums. And yes, for many, for, there were women who benefited over the last 20 years. But for the vast majority of women in Afghanistan, life has not been better, especially since their primary concern for two decades now has been being killed by a Taliban bomb in the road or American bomb dropped from the sky. And I should say not them, but their family, their children, their neighbors, et cetera. So there's been a lot left left out of uh, the American media. Matthew Ho, speaking of what we don't know, and we just have a minute, Central Intelligence sure. Agency, the CIA forces in Afghanistan, what should we understand? And what has the Pegasus spyware revealed? Well, it's my understanding that if for people who are familiar with the Pegasus uh, spyware, this is an Israeli produced spyware that basically hacks uh, phones, communications. Uh, it is, if you look at what occurred in Mexico, many of the politicians assassinated in Mexico over the last year had this Pegasus spyware on their phone. And that my understanding is that there are Pegasus spyware uh, transcripts available that show collusion over this last year between the CIA, between the Afghan government, and between the Taliban. Um, look, what occurred in Afghanistan did not occur just uh, in, in a matter of weeks. This was an offensive planned by the Taliban for well more than a year. Um, and the, res the results of that have been incredibly successful And for the Taliban. So the question needs to be asked is, uh, why, you know, why is it, why is it, why is the American public so unaware of what was actually occurring in Afghanistan to get back to your point about the media? Um, and as we go forward, I think the important thing to do is for the Americans to choose the path of supporting the Afghans by helping them to rebuild and reconcile. To do that, the American embassy must remain open. If people want refugees to leave, the American embassy must remain open. Um, funding must 
continue. If you want organizations like Tolo News to stay on the air, Tolo News was funded by uh, the Americans. Uh, Americans have been funding it for decades now. In order for the media to stay alive in Afghanistan, the U.S. government must continue to support it. So the, at this point, the American government must remain engaged in Afghanistan for the sake of the Afghan people. Matthew people Ho, we're going to leave it there, because in our next segment, we are going to talk about Afghan refugees, someone involved in the resettlement of Afghan refugees in the United States. Uh, but we're going to get back to you in the coming days. The, all of this is such critical information that we are not getting from the corporate media. Matthew Ho, senior fellow with the Center for International Policy, former Marine in Iran and State Department official in uh, Afghanistan, who resigned in 2009, the first U.S. official to publicly resign in protest over the Afghan war. Coming up, we speak with uh, Texas migrant rights group RAISIS about resettling Afghan refugees and response to Republican Texas Governor Greg Abbott testing positive for coronavirus as he vilifies migrants for spreading COVID-19. Stay with us. Tala Muhammad. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In response to the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan, President Biden's allocated half a billion dollars in new funds for reallocating, for relocating Afghan refugees, including those who applied for special immigrant visas, known as SIVs. The U.S. had already vowed to help evacuate over 80,000 Afghan civilians who qualify for these visas and risk retribution from the Taliban, such as translators and interpreters for the U.S. military or NATO. There's already a backlog of more than 17,000 Afghan nationals, 53,000 of their family members awaiting visa approval. For more, we go to Manoj Govindaya. He is the Director of Policy and Government Affairs at the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Educational and Legal Services, known as RAISIS, which has resettled more than 600 Afghan refugees since 2017, including 116 this year, among them 79 kids and a family of 10 just last night. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Manoj. A start off by saying what is happening. You're talking about hundreds. Uh, the number of people who are trying to get out of Afghanistan right now are in the thousands, perhaps the tens of thousands. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. Um, yeah, I mean, we <clears throat> we are talking about thousands of people who are trying to flee Afghanistan. About 18 to 20,000 have applied for something called special immigrant visas, SIVs, which are available to Afghan citizens who provided valuable and faithful service to the United States government or contractors to support their efforts during the, the US-led war. Um, the, the average processing time for this visa is over 800 days. So it takes several years, this process, and it involves all sorts of security checks and background checks and letters of support from U.S. military commanders that confirm an individual's assistance, you know, all, all sorts of um, documents that need to be provided. Uh, in order for someone to apply for this visa and make their way to the United States with permanent residency and eventually be able to bring their family over. Now, of course, if there's 18,000 people who are in the pipeline, we have known for many years, at least 800 days, that there is this number of people who are trying to make their way here who appear eligible for permanent residency in the US. And yet, 
our, our our government, the administration, has taken very few efforts to date to actually support this population, knowing that we are withdrawing from Afghanistan and that this particular group of people who have provided support to the United States are at serious risk of harm once a, a different government in this situation, now the Taliban, take over in the country. Um, the Biden administration has evacuated, I, I think, around a couple thousand folks, nearly 2,000, to uh, Fort Lee in Virginia, and has announced that they will be working on evacuating additional SIV applicants to other military bases, uh, which, which is a start for sure. But, you know, I, I think the entire process um, could have been uh, this entire backlog and this delay in evacuating people could have been um, could have been handled very differently because we've known, you know, I think Trump announced in February of 2020 that he was going to be withdrawing all troops from Afghanistan. Uh, so at, at that moment, we've known that this day is coming and these people are vulnerable. Are they preparing Fort Bliss, a place you know well because of all of the uh, migrants who have been put there? Uh, Fort Bliss in Texas and Fort McCoy um, uh, as well. Um, are they preparing these two places for tens of thousands of Afghans? Yeah, so it is our understanding that Fort Bliss near El Paso and Fort McCoy in Wisconsin uh, are likely to be used um, to house SIV applicants while they continue with the immigration process in the U.S. after they've been evacuated. Um, but, you know, we're we only know that from the media reports. We don't have any other information or knowledge to to suggest that it's accurate. I want to turn to another um, issue. Um, Let's turn to Texas, where Raices is based, where Republican mm -hmm. Governor Greg Abbott has tested positive for coronavirus just a day after he attended a packed, indoor, mostly unmasked Republican fundraiser in Dallas of hundreds. Abbott's office says he's fully vaccinated. Abbott's imposed a statewide ban on vaccine and mask mandates and tried to blame migrants for the spread of COVID-19 in Texas. So we continue with Manoj Govindaya, director of policy and government affairs at Raices, um, which tweeted last night, turns out it wasn't an immigrant or asylum seeker who was spreading COVID-19 all over Texas after all. Manoj, talk about the significance of um, Governor Abbott, it's terrible that he's now come down with COVID. Um, he's getting a very expensive treatment, as Trump did, the monoclonal antibodies. Um, but what he has said about migrants and COVID. It, it, I mean, I, I, it's horrible that he has tested positive, and I genuinely wish him a full recovery. Uh, but, you know, his rhetoric is simply shifting blame for the increase in COVID infections from the, the inefficiency and wrongheadedness of his own policies and putting it on the backs of migrants. You know, public health officials roundly agree that migrants are not necessarily bringing in COVID in any higher numbers than anyone else. We have continued to allow commercial flights internationally. People continue traveling overseas, U.S. citizens and permanent residents continue traveling abroad and coming back. The only difference is they're doing it on an airplane versus coming across a land border. Um, Abbott has taken all types of measures to try to justifying these very harsh, unfair, unjust measures against migrants, um, claiming that they're necessary to protect us from COVID-19, while he's simultaneously banning masks in schools, preventing, uh, banning mask mandates, I should say, preventing local officials from taking actions that could protect their populations. And now we're clearly seeing the result. You know, he attended a a large Republican fundraiser. I'm not sure if that's where he contracted it, but at some point he contracted it. I highly doubt he's come in contact with any of the migrants. We have 10 seconds. The United States. Well, I want to thank you so very it, much. It, 
very concerning hearing this rhetoric from him. Manoj Govindaya, Director of Policy and Government Affairs at RAISIS in Texas. That does it for our broadcast. Democracy Now! produced with Renee Fels, Mike Burke, Dina Gester, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarr, Sain, Natami, Warren, Aftarina, Nadura, Sam, Alcoff, Tamari, Asti, Gio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Annie Masood, Adriana Contreras, our General Manager, Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.